Assalamu alaikum. A couple of years ago, the International Neurosurgery Conference was hosted in Berlin, Germany. The best neurosurgeons in the whole world gathered together under one roof. Each one of them bragging about his amazing skills in brain surgery. Then, suddenly one man from the audience took the microphone and asked for everybody's attention. He said, guys, I am not a doctor. I didn't go to med school. I didn't even go to high school. To be honest, I don't even know how to read or write. But I can show everybody right now that I can perform the most sophisticated brain surgery in the whole world. People assumed he was joking. They thought it was a sketch of some kind or a prank by the organizers. But he said, I am not joking. I am dead serious. Not only I will perform the best surgery in the whole world in front of you, but also I challenge all of these attending and non-attending neurosurgeons to attempt to do a surgery half as good as mine. This story never happened. There was no neurosurgery conference in Berlin. The story that actually happened is when our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, who could not read or write, challenged all the best poets in the whole world and in Arabia to come up with a chapter like the Quran and left all of them in shame, failing to come up with something even close to it. Today, we are going to answer the famous question that is being repeated a lot. What is so special about the Quran that makes it impossible to imitate? Why is it a miracle in itself? How come people keep reading it every day, all their lives, again and again, without ever getting bored from it? Why was reading the Quran itself enough for most Arabic speakers to know that it is from God? And immediately believe without asking for additional evidence. And can non Arabs appreciate the beauty of the Quran through the translation, or is it exclusive only to the Arabic speakers? Today, I will answer all of these questions and more. So, bring your coffee and let's start. Someone might ask, why did you make that analogy? Why did you compare poetry to brain surgery? And the answer is very simple. A lot of people demand that they validate the miracle of the Quran themselves, which is totally fair, but they don't really know how to validate it. For example, in the Prophet's space station video, we talked about the expansion of the universe in the Quran. Did we validate that by building our own telescope and checking the expansion of the universe with our own eyes? No. What we did is we took the words of the expert astrophysicists and compared it to the verses in the Quran. When we talked about the evolution of the moon miracle, for example, did we validate it ourselves or did we compare the information in the Quran to the information in the official NASA Goddard channel? In the Prophet's ultrasound machine video, when we talked about the embryology miracle in the Quran, did we validate it ourselves by learning embryology or did we take the testimony of Dr. Keith Moore? In the Prophet's Biology Center video, when we talked about the health and disease control protocols in Islam, did we validate it ourselves or did we compare it to the protocols of the World Health Organization? Basically, what we have been doing all along is looking for the most reputable and trustworthy sources in every field and to compare their findings to the information in the Quran to prove every miracle. Why don't we follow the same approach in poetry? Why is it always the case that when it comes to poetry, everyone suddenly becomes a born expert who wants to validate the miracle himself instead of just asking for testimonies from experts? When Moses went to Pharaoh, he challenged him in the field that Egyptians were experts in. Pharaoh had a lot of magicians who can make illusions to the eyes of people. Moses challenged the magicians on the day of the feast. Why? 
because in this day everyone is free so a lot of crowd will be gathered to witness the challenge in front of all of them the magicians threw their sticks and ropes on the ground and made an illusion to everyone's eyes to make them think that it is moving but when moses threw his stick he didn't make a magical illusion his stick actually physically turned into a snake right and it ate the ropes and sticks that is far superior to whatever magicians can do so magicians themselves fell on their faces prostrating to allah saying that we believe in the god of moses now focus with me because this is the most important part that you need to catch think about a layman in ancient egypt who was watching the whole event from his perspective he saw the magician's sticks moving like snakes and he also saw the stick of Moses moving like a snake. From the perspective of an untrained eye, he might not understand the difference. He might not understand how the miracle of Moses was far more superior than what they did. But this is not important. Do you know why? Because the magicians themselves prostrated to the God of Moses. You have the testimony of the experts in their fields admitting that what he did was far more superior. To the extent that they fell on their faces in submission. You don't have to learn magic to validate yourself. You have clear confirmation from the experts themselves that they cannot match him. And that is enough proof for the layman. Now let's go back to our beloved prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Disbelievers claimed that he was a liar and he was writing or inventing the Quran himself, even though he could not read or write. Their claim didn't make any sense, but as you know, when you follow your desires, you don't care how ridiculous you sound. Responding to their claim, Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِصُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If you doubt that this is a revelation from God himself, then I challenge you to come up with one chapter like it. If you feel that you can't do it yourselves, then you can seek helpers if what you say is true. فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ But if you were unable to do so, and you will never be able to do so. Then fear the fire that is fueled with people and stones, prepared for the disbelievers. They actually took the challenge, and they gathered the best poets in Arabia. Told the poets, if you come up with something like it, we will rain you with gold and silver. And basically, all of them failed miserably. Let's take the response of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, for example. He was one of the disbelievers, by the way. Instead of writing a poem that challenges the Qur'an, he wrote a poem describing how amazing the Qur'an is. Remember, a disbeliever. مَا فِيكُمْ مِنْ رَجُلٍ أَعْلَمْ بِالْأَشْعَارِ مِنِّي إِنَّ لَقَوْلِهِ لَحَلَاوَةً وَإِنَّ عَلَيْهِ لَطَلَاوَةً وَإِنَّهُ لَمُثْمِرٌ أَعْلَاهُ مُغْدِقٌ أَسْفَلُهُ وإنه لا يعلو وما يعلى وإنه لا يحطم ما تحته. It's poetry. If I translate it, I will butcher it. So sorry in advance. He said, "Oh my people, none of you is more knowledgeable in poetry than I am. And I am telling you, this Quran it has a sweetness to it, surrounded by charm, fruitful its top, and inundating its bottom." It goes high and nothing can go higher, and it destroys whatever is beneath it. This is a testimony from a disbeliever who is an expert in Arabic poetry. Others recorded their testimonies too. Some of them even said, this cannot be poetry, this is magic. It is supernatural, the only way we can deny it's from God is to claim that it is magic. Basically. Those testimonies are exactly the same as the testimonies of the magicians in ancient Egypt regarding the miracle of Moses, the testimony of the experts, and basically the same as NASA confirming information that was revealed 
in the Quran about outer space. I hope you understand my point now. But wait, I have more. After they failed in this challenge, they gave up a bit. But the Quran was becoming a bigger and bigger threat to them. As everyone who listens to it immediately believes in Allah and becomes a Muslim. So the number of Muslims was growing in an alarming rate. So they had to start their plan B. They started telling people not to listen to it. Whatever it takes to push people away from listening to the Prophet while he was reciting the Quran. When the Prophet was reciting, they would raise their voices, clap, sing, whistle, do anything. Anything to distract the attention of people and preventing them from listening to the Quran. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمَعُوا لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَالْغَوْ فِيهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَغْلِبُونَ The disbelievers advised, do not listen to this Quran. Make loud sounds, whistle, sing, distract people away from it. So maybe you will prevail. Isn't that exactly what they are doing until today? A quick side note. I have been educating non-Muslims about Islam for years. I always say to my colleagues, when you are talking to a non-Muslim, don't invite him to Islam. Don't invite him to believe in anything. Your one and only goal is to convince him to read the Quran. If he reads the Quran one time, 99%, you will get a shahada. You just need to break all the barriers they made in his heart from childhood, from the education, to the media and false propaganda. All of these efforts they put to prevent people just from reading one book. If you can help him break all of these barriers and just read the book once, the Quran itself will definitely do the job and convince him. Just hear the story of any of the thousands of reverts on YouTube. They basically all say the same story. First, drowning in worldly desires. Drowning in false information about Islam fueled by Western propaganda. Then they read the Quran one time out of curiosity. Then opened their eyes. Then became Muslim. Always the same story. Anyway, back to the story of the Prophet. I want you to ask yourself, if the disbelievers in Arabia could just write a chapter like the Quran, Wouldn't that be much easier and more cost-effective than making all of this propaganda trying to divert people away from listening to it? Ask yourself, if the words of the Quran are just normal words, insignificant, like any other poetry, why put all of this effort just to distract people away from listening to it? Think about it. Then, after plan B failed, they offered the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, everything a man could desire. Money, authority, women, everything. And you all know the Prophet's famous response. يَعْمْ وَاللَّهِ لَوْ وَضَعُوا الشَّمْسَ فِي يَمِينِ وَالْقَمَرَ فِي يَسَارِ عَلَىٰ أَنْ أَتْرُكَ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ حَتَّى يُظْهِرُهُ اللَّهِ أَوْ أَهْلَكُ فِيهِ مَا تَرَكْتُ I swear to Allah, if they put the sun in my right hand, and the moon in my left. Just to leave this matter, I will not. I will keep preaching the message of Allah until it prevails or I die trying. Ask yourself, if they could just write a chapter like the Quran, wouldn't it be easier and more cost-effective than offering the Prophet all of that stuff? It would have cost them a fortune to give him that bribe. They could just offer 1% of that money to a good poet and get it over with, right? Why didn't they? After they failed in negotiating with him and failed in diverting people away from listening to the Quran, they turned into violence, unfortunately. Torturing and killing early Muslims. And over time, this violence developed into wars with thousands of deaths. All of that could be avoided by just coming up with a chapter like it. The Prophet actually gave them a very simple way to end all of their problems. If you really hate Islam so much, you don't have to waste your money bribing me. You don't have to buy war equipment. You don't have to die fighting. It's so much easier. Just write a chapter like it. So ask yourself, if they could just write a chapter. 
wouldn't it be easier than dying in war fighting him? Writing one chapter would be the end of the whole religion. Throughout history, all enemies of Islam who dream every night about the day they would destroy the whole religion. Why can't all of them combined sit down, help each other, and write a single chapter like it? It is much easier than the propaganda and the lying and the fights and the wars for hundreds of years that never succeeded. Just write a chapter. <laughs> if it was possible, they would have done it. Full stop. According to both the highest authorities in the Arabic language in early Arabia, as well as the linguistic experts of today, there is essentially a consensus on the literary uniqueness of the Quran. Even those who refuse to accept it as divine, they still say that this book is like no other. Even though everyone on earth has access to the Arabic alphabet and are welcome to learn it in a couple of years, maybe more, and take the challenge. No one had come close in the past 1,400 years. And the challenge is still open and will be open until the Day of Judgment. And for me, the, my, my favorite part of the Quran is in Surah Al-Baqarah. It's in this verse that Allah sets a challenge for the whole of mankind. If you can match that, then you can disprove Islam. And that was, that had such strong meaning for me because I thought of all these people that say the Quran's not real, Allah doesn't exist, uh, Muhammad made everything up. They'll have lengthy debates for hours and hours, but they won't do this one simple challenge. How long can it take them? But in 1400 years, not one person has been able to do this. And the second part of this, uh, this surah that, that meant a lot more to me, is that Allah goes on to say that you will not be able to. And I just think to anyone out there that's doubting Islam, then take this challenge. Something else that everyone actually can witness without the help of experts is something very unique about the Quran. Today, almost 200 million people around the world memorize it. 200 million. Memorize it from cover to cover, letter by letter, vowel by vowel. What is even more impressive about that is that the majority of them don't even speak Arabic. The Quran is shockingly very easy to remember in a way that no one can explain. If you give me a paragraph written in a foreign language and ask me to memorize it, that would be torture to me. I can't imagine myself memorizing only one page in Japanese, for example, even pronouncing it correctly. Seems impossible to me. But the Quran defies all the expectations and common logic with the verse in Surat Al-Qamar. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ and we have certainly made the Qur'an easy to remember. So, is there anyone who will be mindful? Think about how it seems impossible to memorize one page written in Chinese, while hundreds of millions of 10 years old kids, 12 years old kids, 50 years old men and women, decide to start memorizing the full 600 pages Qur'an without understanding Arabic. And they all succeed. What is so different about it that makes it so easy to remember? And not only that, it also fills your heart with warmth whenever you recite it. After reciting the same page for the, I don't know, one millionth time, you still get from it joy and satisfaction in your heart that cannot be felt in other way in your life. Ask anyone from all of those 200 million Hafiz to confirm what I've just said right now. Ask them about the joy and satisfaction. Ask them, what do you mean when you say, the Quran is the spring of my heart? If you read a piece of literature or even listen to your favorite song non-stop every day for 10 years, you would be saying, kill me please before I listen to it one more time. 
But what is so miraculous about the Quran is the fact that the more you repeat it, the more it becomes beautiful, calming, and joyful. All of that can be easily confirmed by Arabic speakers as well as non-Arabic speakers alike. To summarize all of that in one sentence, it is beyond the limitation of what humanity can write. It is the words of God himself. If you didn't read it, then unfortunately, you missed out on everything in this life. Whenever we talk about the miraculous Quran, the most asked question is why Arabic? Why was the Quran revealed in Arabic and not English, for example? And you know what? I love it when people ask this question because the answer should be common knowledge to everyone. Before I answer, I will ask you one question first. If you are watching a video on a 4K TV, the latest OLED or QLED 4K TV, and then you go watch the same video on a very old TV that has 480p resolution. Which picture will have more details? Which picture will be more clear? And which picture will be more beautiful? Which of both of the pictures will contain more information? Of course, the 4K TV, right? That is because the 4K TV has a total of 8.3 million pixels, while the 480 TV only has 480,000. See the difference 8.4 million versus 480,000? So if you want to deliver a message to your family, for example, you would rather record it in the highest quality possible, right? And you want to make sure that every detail is captured. The same applies to language. According to BBC, there are an estimated 171,146 words currently in use in the English language. That is according to the Oxford English Dictionary, not to mention the 47,156 obsolete words. 171,000 words in English, right? You know what? Let's be generous. Let's say 200,000 words. Do you know how many words? are there in the authentic Arabic? Guess. 13 million words. Million. Can you see the difference between a language that has 13 million words and a language that has 200,000? Actually, using the analogy of 4K TV and the 480p TV is not fair because the difference between the two languages is far more extreme. Allah is going to send one message to all humanity that contains their religion from the 7th century up to the Day of Judgment. Of course, Allah will choose a language that has enough tools, words, expression to clearly explain his message in a way that does not leave us confused after that. Exactly for the same reason, you would prefer to shoot your important videos in the best quality possible to preserve as much information as you can. That is why we struggle all the time trying to translate the Quran for non-Arabs. The translation we have now compared to the original words of God is exactly like, let's say, you are watching your favorite YouTuber describing how amazing the new 8K television is, but you are watching this YouTuber in an old black and white tube TV from the 50s. No matter how much he is trying to describe the amazing vivid colors that he is seeing and filming it using his camera for you, you are watching him on a black and white fat tube. You can never imagine what he's saying to you. You have an idea, yes, but the whole experience is gone. I remember watching Nu'man Ali Khan one time trying to translate one word in Arabic. It was Al-Qadr to English speakers. It took him 25 minutes, 25 minutes trying to help them understand one Arabic word. In my head, I was like, man, you have patience. He did a very good job, by the way. Another example. This is Mustafa Khattab, one of our brothers in Canada who made a very, very nice translation of the Quran. This is what he thinks of his own product. 
So sometimes we have concepts and structures in the Quran in Arabic that cannot be translated into English. In the Arabic language, you have more than a thousand words for lion. Uh, you have so many different levels of friendship, love, sleep, enmity, and so on and so forth. But the English language is, is like miskin, is limited. And this is why many of those nights when I was translating the Quran, and I used to break my head over some of those concepts, because we don't have an equivalence in the English language. Subhanallah. So subhanAllah, I was working and there are some ayat that took me like a whole week to translate one ayah. You know, yes, I did the initial translation, but to be fully satisfied with an ayah, sometimes it took longer than that. You know, like this particular ayah in Surah Ma'idah, فَإِنْ عُثِرَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُمَ اسْتَحَقَّ إِثْمًا فَآخَرَانِ يَقُومَ It talks about wasiyah, but hmm. the ayah is so powerful in Arabic. And, you know, in English, when you compare the English to the Arabic, the Arabic, the English is so lame and, and so... Uh, and so limited. In most languages, if someone sends me a message, some of his words might have different meanings due to the limitation of the language itself. I might have to text him back and tell him, did you mean this or did you mean that? It happens to every one of us, a lot. But in authentic Arabic, there is a word for everything. There are words that we call sniper words. Words that have only one very narrow specific meaning that cannot be interpreted otherwise. And there are words that we call shotgun words that collect different meanings together. You can use them whenever you intend to. And there are normal words like the one we use in English. The probability of having a misunderstanding between two parties communicating in the authentic Arabic language is near zero. That is in addition to having different words that are describing the same thing but conveying different feelings. Or the different verbs that have the same exact meaning but they convey different amounts of effort and time put doing the verb. Also the huge number of literary devices available in Arabic. The list goes on and on and on. Allah said in Surah Az-Zukhruf, Certainly, I made the Qur'an in Arabic, so perhaps you will understand. Only in Arabic, there will be no confusion, no miscommunication. Only in Arabic, you will not feel the need to ask, did you mean this? Did you mean that? Hope it's clear now. That was the first reason. The second reason was the challenge. If you read a little bit about the history of Arabia between the 6th and the 7th century, those people took pride in their poetry, to the extent of linking their poetry to their honor. Even sometimes starting wars because of a piece of poetry written about one of the tribes. Poetry was their way to express everything. Love and romance, hate and enmity, even to make peace treaties or trade. Combine all of that with having the most sophisticated language ever. Can you see how those people were the best people to be challenged to write one chapter like the Quran? Because if these people cannot come up with it, then no one could even think about trying. Got it? The best Arab poets today can't even produce something as good as the ancient Arabic poetry. Imagine challenging the Qur'an itself that the ancient Arabs failed to imitate. After learning all that, some people say to me, that's not fair, you're lucky to be an Arab. You can easily connect and understand the Qur'an, but for us to do so, we have to put a lot of effort learning Arabic. Well, yes, but there are three things you have to put into consideration here. Number one, Allah gives you a blessing and with it responsibility. Yes, I had easier time learning authentic Arabic, but that also comes with an obligation on me to dedicate part of my time every day translating and helping Muslims and non-Muslims around the world to learn the Quran. And from your side, you get millions of Arabic speakers who would love to help you out for free. There is that. And number two, Allah rewards your effort, not the results. This is the difference between Allah and the human boss, for example, who would only look at your achievements regarding how hard it was for you to achieve it. 
Allah rewards your effort, records a good deed for every struggle you have. So your reward will be much, much, much bigger than mine. And finally, number three, the Quran is both a message and a sign. You don't need to learn Arabic to get the message. Scholars already provided the basic knowledge every Muslim should have, almost on every language on earth. You can learn the whole creed and the Sharia law in any language today. What you actually need Arabic for is to experience the sign and to experience the heartwarming beauty of the words of God firsthand. It's a choice. You can decide to do it or not. It's not an obligation. Reading the translation alone would be like taking a 2D image of a 3D object. The photo will give you a good idea about it, but it will never deliver the full experience. So it's your choice. Another common question is, can we make an official English translation for the Quran, revise it very very good, make sure it's 100% accurate and then use it from now on? And the answer is no we can't. For three reasons. The first one is, it is impossible to actually have a translation that encompasses the full meaning of every verse. Whenever you read the Quran translations, you should always actually open several translations at the same time. And you should also open tafsir. Why? Because when you read all of them, you might think they are saying different things sometimes. But they are actually not. Each one of them is trying to show you a different angle from the verse. Remember when I told you the verse itself is like a 3D object and the translation is just a 2D screenshot of it. So when you read all of them together, you might get a better view. The second reason is obviously these are the words of God. We keep it as it is. And the third reason is others tried it before us and it led to devastating results. Let me show you something funny. I will open Google Translate. I will write Wizarat at Tarbiya wa Ta'lim. The translation says Ministry of Education. But there is a catch. I wrote here three words, but in the translation I only got two. Let's go one by one. Wizara is ministry. At Tarbiya is education. At Ta'lim also is education. So the full translation is the Ministry of Education and Education. How does that make sense? The problem actually is in this word, Tarbiya. The word has no English equivalent whatsoever. Tarbiya means the act of teaching moralities, ethics, and raising decent human beings, teaching them what is right and what is wrong. Does not exist in the English language for some reason. The other word, ta'lim, means the act of teaching science, history, math, language, all of that. And yes, this one exists in the English language. So Google Translate decided, you know what, we're not just going to write a full paragraph describing the meaning. We're going to ignore it and just say Ministry of Education. Actually, I don't blame them. Now let's focus on the important part. Let's focus on the word tarbiya. One of the derivatives of this word is the word rabb or Rabbi. Rabbi refers to the one who teaches me moralities, the one who tells me what is right and what's wrong, the one who I trust enough to follow when he says do and don't. I can refer to Allah with the word Rabbi, so Allah is Rabbi. But I also can refer to my father with the same word, Rabbi, as both of them can tell me do and don't, and I obey both. So God is Rabbi, my father is also Rabbi, but God is not my father. You see where I am going, right? Imagine that we have a verse that refers to God by the word Rabbi. This verse got translated to the Greek language, then got translated from Greek to Latin, and finally got translated to English. And because we already know that the word Rabbi does not exist in the language we are translating to, the translator might just use the word Father for it, as it is the closest word to the word Rabbi. And suddenly, the verse reads as follows. God is my Father. But that's wrong. Like this verse, for example, John 20. I am ascending to my Father and your Father 
to my God and your God. After a thousand years have already passed, can you convince the people now that the original quote could have been different? Can you convince people now that there might have been a word like Rabbi in the Aramaic language that got translated later into Father because this word does not exist in other languages? Think about it. One final thing I want to share with you before I end this video. I was writing the script of this video around six months ago. And I was getting help from some brothers who are much, much more knowledgeable than me in this subject. They provided for me around 60 examples on how different the Quran is from any other literature that existed. And how the Quran is written in Arabic language but does not resemble Arabic language at the same time. Big story. Anyway, they also gave me tons of materials about the different criteria experts use to compare between Quran and other literature. To be honest, I delayed this video for six months for a reason. The explanations were very, very, very difficult. And most of the time, I could actually use them as sleeping pills. I thought if I have been learning the authentic Arabic language for all of these years and still find this extremely difficult, how can I explain all that to non-Arabic speakers in a way that does not make them report me? Then I thought to myself, I already explained hundreds of scientific miracles by showing the testimonies of experts in each field. Why don't we just use the same approach when it comes to poetry? Especially after I understood that poetry is actually as complex of a field as any other. That is why this video may be a little bit different than what you might have expected. Anyway, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, this information will be very helpful to people seeking the truth or people seeking to strengthen their faith. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, whoever leads to good is like the one who does it. So don't let this video stop with you. Help it spread by engaging with it with likes and comments and then sharing it on your social media accounts. And by the way, you can download it and upload it to your accounts. It's copyright free. And if you want more evidence about Islam and more miracles of the Quran and Sunnah, check out this playlist. I am sure you will love it. Thanks and salam alaikum. <laughs> ويسألونك عن الجبال فقل ينسفها ربي نسفا فيذرها قاعا صفصفا فيذرها قاعا صفصفا لا ترى فيها عوجا ولا وخشعت الأصوات للرحمن وخشعت الأصوات للرحمن فلا تسمع إلا همسا يومئذ يتبعون الداعي لا عوج له وخشعت الأصوات للرحمن وخشعت الأصوات للرحمن فلا تسمع إلا همسا يومئذ لا تنفع الشفاعة إلا من أذن له الرحمن له الرحمن ورضي له قولا يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم يعلم ما بين 
يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون به علما وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم وقد خاب من حمل ظلما وقد خاب من حمل ظلما وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم وقد خاب من حمل ظلما وعنت الوجوه للحي القيوم وقد خاب من حمل ظلما ومن يعمل من الصالحات وهو مؤمن فلا يخاف ومن يعمل من الصالحات وهو مؤمن فلا يخاف فلا يخاف ظلما ولا هضما وكذلك أن أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا وصرفنا فيه من الوعيد وصرفنا فيه من الوعيد لعلهم يتقون أو يحدث لهم ذكرا فتعالى الله فتعالى الله الملك الحق ولا تعجل بالقرآن من قبل أن يقضى إليك وحيه وقل رب زدني علماً